Hey there, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Devan, I'm the Total Connector. I'm so super excited to have Jeff Booth on, on my show. I've read his book, uh, The Price of Tomorrow, uh, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future. He, his background is really fascinating. He's got like 20 years experience building up, you know, like a half a billion uh, uh, market uh, cap uh, a company. And um, he, you know, he, he's, on, he's on the board of so many technological comp companies. And his book is just amazing. I, I, I read it like three times and, and t wrote down like eight pages of, 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 you know, of quotes and questions I have. And because not even the book of, you know, the excellent book of Sahira Moose, even though it's really excellent, couldn't answer me all those uh, questions. Because this is what I always envision, like what could the world the our future human civilization look like on a monetary root layering of Bitcoin, you know, the hardest, scarcest, soundest money, decentralized, uh, 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 distributed ledger, you know, and, and, and really uh, a sound, logical, ethical money. Uh, what could the world look like? And this is, you know, where it comes to the practicality, like, uh, you know, the, and the process of how we can achieve this. So eventually, yeah, uh, deflationary technology is already here, and because we're paying, you know, uh, less and less, or even free, it's actually a lot of things are free actually already. So if you just expand it into other sectors of technology, with transportation, energy, uh, you know, all these technologies that are just either you know in the closets or under the hood, or you know, in the name of, name of national security, patent system, or what have you. So it's the root of this whole thing is the as he says himself you know jeff booth says you know he calls it ponzi scheme and i call it just you know a, a, a criminal monetary economical system uh untouchable criminal immune central banks uh anyway without further ado um not going into a rant now but uh, uh hope you're gonna love this uh let me know your questions your comments afterward thanks so much for listening and for support Without further ado, this is my talk with Jeff Booth, the author of The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future. Make sure you follow him. Hey, Jeff. How are you doing? Thanks Great. so much for your time and welcome to the show. Thanks. All right. Um, Jeff, I'm going to try to give a, um, my best. I'm going to try my best because you've got a you know, really fascinating background, just a brief overview, you know, um, uh, sort of your, your bi biography. So you came out, uh, you were one of the front leaders, visionary leaders when it, uh, when it comes to e-commerce, information technologies, uh, and all kinds of other technologies. And you've been co-founder you know, of so many um, you know, companies. You're, you're sitting on the board of a lot of, 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 of um, you know, uh, think tanks or, or you know, entrepreneurial think tanks, I would call them, and companies. Um, you were also um, you know, featured in a lot of, you know, mainstream news outlets like Forbes and, 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 uh, and, and even named as one of the uh, 100 most intriguing entrepre entrepreneurs. Um, so maybe you could give my listeners a little bit deeper uh, dive um, how you came to write this book and what does deflation really mean? Okay. Uh, so I, I wrote the book because it's sitting at the front seat of technology and, and lots of friends in the, the, in the technology field and, and the AI field. And, and so it's a network that I'm very familiar with and, uh, and, and love what's going on, how fast the world's changing, how fast really great entrepreneurs are seizing on opportunities uh, to, to make the world better. Right. That's what uh, that's what that's what they're doing. They're not setting up businesses to try to hurt people. They're setting up businesses to try to make the world better. But when I looked at it in a narrow view, um, I love every, every one of the companies I'm involved with. Um, but when I would broaden that perspective and I look at it in a, in a broad view and what's in a world view, I, I realized that this can't work with the existing economic system because it's deflationary. Um, and, and an existing economic system is inflationary. So you have two opposing forces trying to fight each other, um, and it's breaking, and that those opposing forces are breaking society. So, and, and so I'll go into your second question. Um, if you think about inflation or deflation, um, deflation is when your money gets more valuable, goods and services get lower in cost, 
and inflation is the opposite. Your your money gets less valuable, and and uh, and things get more expensive. And so, so, and and it's worth just pausing on that instead of grabbing the emotion that we normally attach to that word because we've been taught deflation is bad, right? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. We grew up in economics and everything else. Deflation is a bad thing. You want to avoid it at all costs. And so it's worth saying why is why is my, my money getting more valuable a bad thing, right? It's not. Different winners, different losers. Um, if, you're, if you hold cash and you have an inflationary environment, and your money's getting uh, worthless, then you shouldn't hold cash. You should, uh, you should buy assets and, and, and vice versa. So it's just worth pausing and having listeners think about that for a second and then, and then the consequences. And so the consequences are if if you're in an inflationary environment um, and you own real estate, um, real estate will go up as cash is the value of your money goes uh, uh, goes down. If you're in a de deflationary environment, everything's going to fall. Your cash is worth more. So we've grown up in an inflationary environment. So of all the policymakers, all of the models look back at an inflationary environment. And technology creates everything cheaper. It's a deflationary environment, and there's nothing that governments can do short of debasing their currencies to stop it. Stop it. It's too great a force. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, I love your book, Jeff. It's it's amazing. I mean, it, the, the some of some of the answers is exactly what I've been actually waiting for, or or in connection with uh, you know with the whole content. I've been trying to go deeper into the rabbit hole with a lot of other guests when it when it comes to bitcoin like because you've really um um in a in a really eloquent and and and, and visionary way uh, it uh, really went down to the root causes of uh first of all that this whole monetary economical system is for the pre-technological era right so um could you because I've I've got like eight pages of questions over here, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to keep it. I'm I'm going to you know take it, do it like one by one, and maybe if we have time at the end, I'm going to go a little bit deeper. So you talk about first uh, in the chapter a call to action about the monopolies or monopoly companies that, you know, uh, the, you raise the question: Are they going to be relevant at all in the future? And you know, and and you you have the, you know very legitimate question like how we're going to transition, uh, like you know, in terms of long-term thinking. And then you, if I may quote you, you say the rules by which we all play, you know, the game, you know, uh, alluding to governments and central banks and a false choice from uh, frameworks built for a time before technology when the world operated differently. And then you talk about debt, you know, the whole debt infused, the debt system will need to be totally restructured or, you know, transformed. Can you go a little bit deeper? Like, what are the fundamental transformational requirements that we need? Um, uh, especially when you talk about, like, uh, you raise like a really good question, like, what if the governments, you know, uh, at, you know, do we need to wait like until the governments at, uh, uh, per permit it, like, give us the permission? Do we need the permission for that? Um. So you've gone in a whole bunch of different uh, tangents Sorry, there, but okay. I'll, no, that's okay. <laughs> but I'll, uh, I'll I'll start with if you artificially uh, decrease inter interest rates to drive inflation, right? So if governments at at all costs monetary easing, low interest rates now to negative interest rates in most parts of the world, negative real interest rates. The U.S. is going to go negative interest rates and, and significantly negative interest rates, but so is everyone. If you if you warp capitalism by doing that, the incentive structure to hold cash is really bad, right? Because you're destroying the cash value. So what they think they're doing is trying to drive growth. And how many years does uh, uh, do, do you need to hear central banks saying we can't get inflation up? To believe they can't, <laughs> right? It's 25 years now that they've been trying the same, and 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 the result of all that effort has added $185 trillion of debt um, to drive $46 trillion of economic growth. Most of that debt is going into asset prices, right? And so, and it's, it's all connected because you've created incentive structure not to hold cash, right? 
which gets it to spend, which increases debt at a crazy rate. And, and even the debt alone, forget the technology for a minute, it's a way bigger driving force, but even the debt alone, if you assume the debt has to be paid back, which it does, right, unless you debase your currency, if you assume the debt has to be pay, uh, paid back, then that's a drag alone on future growth because the taxes have to go up significantly to pay back the debt. Right. And that reduces money to be able to pay for uh, in, in the growth. It's no difference if it's you or me. Um, if, if you take a whole bunch of money um, and borrow a whole bunch of money, you can look really rich in the short term. Um, you're, you can hire gardeners and you can uh, build new houses and everything else. And if you can't pay that back, then you go into bankruptcy or if you can pretend if you can get another loan to pay some of it back and then that, that's all we're doing so we're pulling demand forward massively which has to be paid back at some point why 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 what's happening now uh and you're hearing mmt and you're hearing all sorts of kitchen sink crazy ideas negative that, interest uh, rates negative <laughs> interest rate, right. mmt like how far past the point of rescue do you need to be to realize that this is if if, if an economic system requires bailouts every number of years mmt negative interest rates everything else um can't you see the patient's already dead right but now the opposite side of the problem with that much debt in the world before COVID, over $250 trillion of known debt, there's way more in unfunded yeah, uh, liabilities, yeah. liabilities mm, and everything derivatives. else, all of <laughs> China, uh, everything else. It's just it's so many options. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's staggering. Against a world economy that was $80 trillion and now it's a lot smaller, right? And so that's before. The debt just exploded, or and it's going to explode a lot more, and the economy is lower. At what point does it just look like a Ponzi scheme, right? And and governments realizing it, it's saying, "Oh my God, we need more debt to solve the problem we created in the first place," right? It doesn't sound very logical. But on the other side of this, if you allow deflation, um, if you if you allow nature to take its course, what's what's going to happen anyways? Mm -hmm. the debt explodes in real terms right so imagine you making less and less each year but your mortgage stays the same your mortgage gets way more expensive to pay right um now all the costs of the other things in your life come down each year as well right mm -hmm. but your mortgage the debt explodes in real terms so so that's what governments are trying to stop because it's a reset button of the entire financial system uh, if you, especially if you do it in a disorderly way, but it's going, it's and this pace, it's going to happen in a dis disorderly way at some point in the future, anyways. So, uh, I, I'm, yeah, I, I, and, and and I wrote the book kind of, and I think if, if you think about your children, my children, and next generation people uh, coming up, they're going to live with these consequences, um, and their world won't lo their their world won't look like the one we grew up with. Uh, and with all of the opportunities and choice and everything, everything else, because we're, we're, we're pushing all of that, uh, pay, paying for that. I'm not sure into, I understand. Oh, sorry. Um, series, <laughs> <laughs> uh, series uh, on, <laughs> um, but, but we're pushing all of that into the future and it's, and, and, and I wrote the book hoping we could have an orderly, uh, uh, transition to that, that future, that the future could look really abundant instead of uh, the path we're on i wish that every student every uh you know every kid uh you know at least um, from a certain age on should read this book jeff uh, and with all honesty uh, the book is called the price of tomorrow where deflation is the key to an abundant future and let me tell you something because uh you probably i don't know have you read the book of um uh, safid and amus um the bitcoin standard yeah, okay so on page i think it's somewhere 96 to 98 and i asked this over and over to a lot of guests but you are the first one who is really going exactly into the core you know issues of you know what kind of future could possibly realistically await us as a society individual civilization i think people cannot wrap their heads around it we can have a totally uh you know evolutionary civilization on a scientific technological a social, economical, and spiritual level, even uh, with uh, you know, I mean, this is a 
you know, Bitcoin podcast show. So <laughs> with the hardest and scarcest money, which, which, as you say, in your own book, it is decentralized or distributed. It's, it's uncontrollable. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it has all the monetary properties that we would, we would need. Do you want to like you know, dive deeper into like, why do you think Bitcoin could be, I mean, from your perspective, the ultimate maybe candidate for, you know, for a new deflationary, um, world um economic well, let's, let's first let's first um talk about some of the uh, what could happen with deflation right what could happen uh, uh, with deflation it, because a lot of people are scared to death of it yeah. right and it's just who wins who loses right it's uh but deflation alone uh, when john maynard keynes wrote his uh, wrote his famous essay in 1930 uh, that said it was called the economic possibilities for our grandchildren he predicted at this time that we would be working 15 hour work weeks. Mm -hmm. And until 1970, we were on a trend that looked exactly like that. So he looked at all the technology advances and he forecasted them forward on an exponential trend, not on a linear trend. Um, and a lot of people uh, take his work and they, uh, they maybe in the Bitcoin community, don't know he's the father of Keynes and mm. economics, right? And so, but a lot of what he was say, a lot of what he was saying, he forecast, uh, forecasted well. Um, the 15 hour work week has changed because we've debased currency and we've driven money into the hands, some hands of some and, and taken it from others. That's what's happened. Right, because we went off the gold exchange, and we because we went off of, uh, because every country is is manipulating their currency, and and it starts slowly, and then it speeds up, and they have to manipulate more and more, and 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 that's what's happening all over the world right now. And it doesn't matter. So, if China is going to drive massive drive currency values down, so they can increase their layer, so they can keep people working then and we buy more from china right and and then everybody in china knows oh my god my currency is going to be devalued i need to get my money out of china and i need to put it in real estate or something like that you can see the folly of this right it's just it's just it's created uh, warped incentives and everything else all over the world because what is the value of money um and, and we're distorting that uh we're distorting that underneath there is no fixed exchange exchange all over the world and that is the cause of what we're, we're that's the cause of what we're talking about um why people aren't working 15 hours and having a lot of free time is technology has done more of the work because we've enriched some artificially and taken from some artificially mm -hmm. and um and so so if you look if you look forward why do you need to so for first let's say if governments or think of what they're doing you're propping up asset prices naturally, right? That should fall, bailouts, taking Fed money off balance sheets that would have would have priced the system properly again. Things would have fallen like crazy, and the and the people with cash would have bought those assets for pennies in the dollars, and they would be the new uh, uh, wealthy, right? Instead, you've propped up uh, prices unnaturally by all of these kitchen sink type of uh, items and then on that very other side because you pick the pocket of savers and you pick the pocket of a whole bunch of fixed income people you have to go in and develop social programs for them to pay for higher asset prices that wouldn't be there unless you created them in the first place that's where we are right it seems logical to me that if you just let things fall to their natural course capitalism would work perfectly right things things would fall the people who wanted to work more would work more they would take more of the pie just not an egregious level of the pie right now that's been been artificially gifted to them <laughs> they would be creating value and, and and prices would fall along the natural trajectory that they should because of technology um when you who's going to give up their smartphone right this your smartphone was only invented 13 years ago mm -hmm. and and it's all free Everything on it is free. The more things that are run by technology, the more price, uh, uh, more price drops. I don't buy a camera anymore. I don't. Uh, I don't buy a guitar tuner anymore. I don't buy a whole bunch of things anymore. It's all on my phone. 
but we don't have a free market capitalism, right? Which you say in your book also, we don't have one. So what do we need to do in order to create, would, could that be Bitcoin? Is Bitcoin so the free so that, market that, capitalism? So that's why, that's why and, and, and I've said this on a couple of other Bitcoin, so I'm, I'm, I love the community, right? But, but some in the community, like burn it down, right? Mm -hmm. I would, I, I, and, and I'd be careful about burn it down. Right, a better transition to Bitcoin mm -hmm. would be if governments actually started adopting it, moved to it, um, and 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 we transition there rather than because if we have a disorderly unwind to Bitcoin, which could easily happen, which is actually the, pro the most probable course, um, if we have a disorderly unwind to Bitcoin, um, holding Bitcoin is going to be dangerous too because the society is going to be it's just going to upend society so brutally and if you think about what that looks like um that's not a very very fun society to be living in e either a lot of times people project only one dimension their dimension of what bitcoin looks like instead of the <laughs> second order effects and everything else so i think it's important to it would be way better for all the bitcoin people to get together with the gold people to say we all believe in the same thing Right, mm -hmm. we believe money needs to be need, needs to be attached to something that's uh, that can't be manipulated. Uh, um, you believe it in, in gold. So with gold, I think um, the only reason gold is worth it, call it an eight trillion, seven and a half trillion dollar market cap, is because it used to be fixed to to, to money. Right? right, it's not because of jewelry. And 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 there's many that believe that it will be fixed, uh, pegged to money again. Um, I don't. Um, I don't I think don't, either. I, no. I don't. I think it's. I, I think it's. Uh, it's a. It's an old. It was the best of the time. So but it, it failed. A lot. It failed, it, right? It, I mean, exactly. cent but centralization or whatever. You know, how do you assay the validity, the authenticity of the gold? It's, it's a lot of, you know, problems and flaws, and which I think has been proven now. Don't yeah. It, 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 yes, but. But again, there's a whole bunch of people with a belief, and that in it, and it worked for a long time, and mm -hmm. it, it actually made the world, it weighed world trade better, and then it failed for the same reasons uh, you're talking about. And there's a lot of people that believe that it's going back there again because it worked uh, for a time. Time. So that if you believe that, that, and and gold will probably go a lot higher from here. Right. Um, and then, but Bitcoin is about what now? Uh, 130, 140 okay. trillion dollar market cap, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and and so if you look at the asymmetric bet on Bitcoin, how much upside versus downside, um, I cannot believe more people aren't in it. They should be putting money in it <laughs> in a big in a, in a big way, even if it's if it's to protect wealth, well, ten percent of your portfolio. Right. If it's to gain wealth, a lot more than that. Right now, there is risk on it too. But if I look at first principles of the whole thing and I say, what is likely to happen? What is likely to happen is governments keep doing what they're doing. And at some point, either, and if that happens, then there's going to be massive damage economically, socially, everything else. And people are going to look for a trusted medium of exchange. And you can see this happening in other areas. You can see Venezuela, right? Venezuela had 1.8 million percent interest last year. At the same time, Bitcoin lost 30 percent of its value. Um, I would rather lose 30 percent than 1.8 million percent, right? And then now Bitcoin's way uh, way up again. So, um, and all the people that had Bitcoin in Venezuela um, could eat. They could transfer their cross borders. They could. Uh, uh, so it saved families. It saved it saved people. Do you think those people will ever be off Bitcoin? Right. And so as that happens, more and more come into it. It works on a network effect and it becomes a trusted medium. And at some point, I think governments have to peg to it. So I think the upside is staggering. It'll still, because of the pressure of miners to sell and because of the incentive structures baked into it, the, um, which, is, which are brilliant, um, it'll still fluctuate a bunch right, uh, uh, right now as we go through the halving. Um, but uh, but long term, it's uh, I, I see I see it most likely being the new uh, reserve currency. Mm -hmm. The conditions right now, if you I mean if we just look around, it's 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 mind boggling. I mean we got what thirty million unemployed now, United States 
we got it. You know, you mentioned Venezuela. I'm just, I just uh, read in, again something about uh, Lebanon. You know, um, uh, we're gonna probably do a talk about this with some other insiders who have a little bit more insight into Lebanon or Iran. I'm originally from Iran. I was born there, but I grew up in Austria and in the states. Um, um, and then you know, there's this talk about UBI, universal basic income, and I'm like, do we really need universal? Do really, you know, wouldn't wouldn't actual people have much more prosperity, abundance, and you know, super low cost life, and more quality of life than if they were on a UBI? What's what's your take on that? Yeah, and you know, I because I talk about it a bit in the, the book, it, it, but it's attached to this. So I'm gonna, so yeah, I'm a government. I'm gonna artificially create wealth in some people, and they think they got it through natural. They think they got it because of their ingenuity, and they only got it because. They owned a whole bunch of assets before other people did, and they artificially made the, their assets more valuable. And then I, then I need to, because I punished a whole bunch of people in that trade. <laughs> I killed, I picked the pocket of a whole bunch of people who now can't get the assets, can't afford the assets, and have to pay higher rents on those assets to be able to live. So I, I put a whole bunch of people in stress because of that trade. And then... UBI said, I'm going to keep doing that, right? I'm going to keep doing, I'm doing that right now. Right now, that's what we're doing. And then, and then a whole bunch of people are rising up with pitchforks because they can't eat. And I, then I'm going to go and tax those people at the top to be able to create UBI to pay a, a sum to the people on the bottom to people to pay for false, falsely high asset prices. It's insanity. Um, yeah. if you, and what are the wealthy people going to do? I mean, there's this jurisdiction arbitrage. They're going to, you know, if they can, I mean, it, you know, as long as it's possible, then, you know, escape to another, you know, offshore, you know, just. But that's the problem all over the world. You're seeing the same thing. You're right. seeing this, like there, there is, that's actually why I said, that as far as Bitcoin, um, you want an orderly transition. You want governments to understand this or the new governments that replace them to understand this and figure out the, the path to transition to this uh, to an abundant future because if you don't if you don't it won't be one place in the world like it's this is going to happen everywhere it's going to be a, a it's 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 going to be a real mess um and for populations everywhere that are le left out there will no i hate talking about uh, uh, this on podcast but i, I will um what what did nazi germany look like under hitler yeah. And effectively, all he did is targeted the people who own the assets, right. right? And and he created an enemy because it's easy to create an enemy when people uh, uh, when when people are feeling uh, like it's not their fault, it's somebody else's fault. So politicians, right? Now, you can see that you can see this starting to happen all over the world, right? Politicians yeah. are creating internal enemies um to be able to galvanize their base and when you don't have a big enough so it looks like create internal enemy to be able to get in power great uh when you don't have a big enough internal enemy you need an external enemy right and and so that path forward on an existing path by effectively fighting gravity right central banks fighting gravity um which they will not win technology is too powerful a force in the end um is is creating all sorts of damage. So divide and rule is again, you know, just the same script in a different color, right? I mean, yeah, I, 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 that, this all sounds really dark and it is dark on our existing path. Mm -hmm. I, I can't say it, but that why, why I had to go through some of these things in the book is because if you don't understand them and you think everything's uh, great, then you probably won't change, right? Mm -hmm. and so a whole bunch of people need to step up right now and lead this message. Because, because our future could look totally different. It could be yeah. abundant. It could be fantastic. We can't even um, imagine probably, right? I mean, we can't even imagine. We want to um, talk to you about this, like about the yeah. other technologies, because I know, I'm sorry, Jeff, to interrupt, but I know you, you, your focus is on, uh, let's say, you know, specific information technologies, computer technologies, uh, commerce technology. Uh, but I mean, you touch upon it in the book, but I want to really to have a, like a deeper dive with you. Like, 
there's so many technologists out there with their, you know, they're in the closet or, you know, uh, um, uh, secured somehow by the patent system or not. Uh, I mean, if I just look at some technologists that are just publicly accessible or visible, like whatever, uh, you know, we, we can see all those videos from Boston Dynamics, robot technologies. I mean, at the end of the day, these technologies should be serving us, us humanity. Do you see like a world where all these technologies going to come out of the closets and be really you know, develop, mass produce, and serve us people. That, that's transportation, you know, transportation, energy, all these things, you know. So, uh, so yes, and you, I went through a whole bunch of them in the book, and the logical consequence of those things coming out, and and you could go through the time frames uh, of of some of those. I'm close to so so most of those in Boston Dynamics case, let's say that tech technology, which will come out. It's just too uh, too costly for mass adoption right now. But the price keeps falling and falling and falling. And at some point it goes, uh, just like the Palm Pilot was to, not a right fit till the iPhone, and, it, it, and then the iPhone t t takes off, the smartphone takes off. It's the same analog. And we look backwards on technology when technology is moving exponentially forwards. I just happen to have a front seat at that. I see what's happening in AI really closely. Uh, one, of, one of the top AI researchers, uh, it, I, I'm helping him form a, form a business. Um, and, 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 and it's not on deep learning, it's on probabilistic program, which might be the next level of, of, uh, of, of artificial intelligence. And some, if you knew how fast this was moving and what could happen with it, and if you sat in the front seat of some of these meetings and see what's happening, it's already happening. It's happening at a rate that people can't can't fathom, and it's moving across society. So, it, so it, and it's exciting because, um, and I've said this quite often, but the air you breathe is free, right? Mm -hmm. And it's free because it's abundant. And 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 you can only charge for air underwater, and maybe you can charge for air if we pollute air so badly that. Uh, but 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 you can you can only charge for scarcity, abundance. Uh, scarcity or perceived scarcity. Brands try to create perceived scar uh, scarcity, or uh, but abundance is free. Look at oil prices; what that just happened, um, and and so technology creates that abundance everywhere, right? And it drives uh, and 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 it and and artificial intelligence powered into some of this technology doesn't require the same amount of jobs, and it does a better job. Right. It gives you more, more, if you think about drug discovery, if you think about healthcare system, if you think about all of these things that we have not even touched, mm -hmm. that it's moving at lightning speed, uh, and you add up what's going to happen to economies. Right now, all, the 185 trillion, by the way, before COVID, whatever the number is going to be after COVID, is looking backwards. Looking forward, deflation has just started. Right, Abundance has just started. Mm -hmm. Looking, um, look, looking forward, it touches every single industry, um, and and at blinding speed. Let me talk to you about Bitcoin again because I want to know your position, like or your your vision, how we could implement this seriously. I mean, uh, I, you know, my girlfriend has her own company or shop. She works literally every day, seven days a week, and. Uh, she says, yeah, she would definitely implement, if it was user-friendly, an alternative, you know, optional alternative opt-in uh, payment system. You know, you, you touch upon that, you know, you, you pretty described that pretty well that, you know, we're not ready yet for uh, sort of scalable, whatever, payment technologies when it comes to Bitcoin. But we have, we have already, you know, a lot of interest sort of applications and, but it needs time. I mean, you know, uh, people don't have the time to sit like, like me, you know, like one, two, three days, set up a full node, you know, this and that application. So it's not, yeah, I get it. It's not, you know, it's gotta be, uh, as you say, you know, it's, it's a, it's a exponential technology, but would you say that it could be a cool strategy to, you know, help the small businesses, you know, it's just starting with the small business, the merchants, the shop owners, the small businesses or mid-size, whatever, give them like, like, you know, uh, form a special task force, help these people at least be prepared. Once the transition comes, once, you know, the, sorry, my language, uh, you know, the shit hits the fan. Um, and after, you know, as you said in your book, that like you're kicking down, you know, kicking the can down the road, uh, 
you know, at least people are ready to, to transact, to trade with Satoshi's, yeah. with Bitcoin. I mean, that's the only viable realistic scenario I have in my head, how can, what we can literally effectively implement sort of a strategy. Um, so, so, or, or there's on ramps, off ramps into, into a fiat currency that it, or you can do immediately. Right. Um, mm -hmm. so that would work as well. In fact, that might actually even be better, um, in the short term because it would get more people understanding what it is. So I, so you're talking about Bitcoin being a currency, um, and I th and, and and I'm talking about Bitcoin being a reserve currency. Mm -hmm. So everything to to currency. Could it be a currency as well? Yes, but a lot of things need to happen to be to uh, to, to be a currency, and I don't know if it needs to be. I would hope. I I, I think what a, I think what is likely to happen um, as this progresses is at some point as as uh, as other countries fail um they're gonna they're gonna band together and they're gonna say this makes no sense and we need to peg to something um and they're gonna peg to something like bitcoin and, and if one does two to it's just going to it, it's going to accelerate from there that's what I, it's what I, you have a whole bunch of community that's doing it and then you have countries that start to uh, to do it and it it, uh, it, it becomes a, a reserve status and whether that reserve status is a peg to a currency mm -hmm. or currency itself, it doesn't matter. Right. Do you think there would be like a sort of a tr tipping point where, you know, let's say businesses start thinking, hey, why, why do we, you know, trans, why are we transacting with a medium exchange that is, or with a currency that is, you know, potentially, you know, as we as we see things unfolding inflationary even hyperinflationary uh you know that's what that's what happened in venezuela right mm -hmm. that's why bitcoin was uh valuable and true tr truthfully us dollars became valuable there too <laughs> that's actually why it was so valuable that's why in lebanon right now i think it's lebanon that bitcoin is a way higher price than it is in everywhere else right yeah be uh, be uh, because it's so valuable there that, uh, that there, and, and that doesn't make sense on a uh, decentralized node, but it, the the on road off road there charges a way higher fee. Right? Premiums, <laughs> Pre premium because it's uh, it's in it's in value. Right. So let me go to some other questions. Um, yeah, you wrote in the chapter, who's controlling the money, the, the uh, reset of, you talk about the reset of debts that you, 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 you described that, um, I don't know the quote right now, but some of it's not avoidable anymore. Like, um, yeah, I don't think, well, so, so with deflation, especially if you allow deflation, it's unavoidable. So at some point mm -hmm. there's going to be, uh, there, there has to be a reset, reset. Um, and that reset could happen disorderly or, or like, and that reset could happen in a number of ways. Like, a reset of debt. If you take the Weimar Republic, when they couldn't repay their debt, they turned on the printing presses at full, mm -hmm. full steam, and that created wheelbarrows full of money to buy, buy bread, and that created the rise of Hitler. So, so, um, so the reset could look like hyperinflation, and then on the other side. But at some point, it does actually doesn't matter anyway. So as you go through this, it's going to be deflationary at some point anyways. Right, the, the long term trend. Is going to, so you can drive inflation just by debasing your currency. That's not, like if you do it enough. It, 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 when when you talk about the, these debt numbers, it's so far. Like think about these numbers versus the economy, and then think about how high they're going right now. At some point, how many zeros do you want to add on to it to to believe that it can't be paid back? <laughs> to believe you're like we're, that it's a fairy tale. Everything, and if it if that's the case, um, it it really looks like a Ponzi scheme, right? Yeah. Don't, don't, uh, don't buy bonds at the last minute. Don't be the last one into the bond, bond market and everything else, because at some point, as everyone's heading for the exits, you won't get out. Yeah. And well, to be honest with you, I mean, Ponzi scheme is still for me an understatement. I mean, if, you, if we just look at, if people just understood, like Henry Ford said, you know, once if you if people just understood how money is created, something like that banking system, they would go on the streets and you know trigger a revolution. And you also talk about you know controlling the value of money. To quote you here, can lead to the to the abuse of power, especially 
you know, if the currency is underlying other currencies and, and uh, really went into debt, like, and then you wrote also, since global debt is already so high and expanding quickly, a reset of debt is needed in any truly viable solution. And then you go, you know, uh, what I really love about, like, what's the background of you know, Bretton Woods, at least it was somehow pegged uh, the dollar to the to the gold and, and all the other currencies to the dollar. And so, so the more I think about it, it's like we got to solve this, you know, these all these symptoms. Uh, you know, we're, we're living in a world where we have super centralized, untouchable structures, whether it be, you know, central banks, Bank for International Settlements, the governmental structures, the military industrial corporate complex. It's 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 really a matrix. Like, uh, where do you see this going? I mean, do we have do we do you think do we have the luxury of time? You know, because there's some Bitcoin that is like, hey, we, you know, we have time, we have decades of time. Do you really need? You really so, need decades of time? So you know, you know that I've been talking. So the book came out before this all happened, right? But I talked about in the book that it doesn't matter where the next crisis comes from, right? Because it's like popping a pin in the book balloon, and you see the truth, truth everywhere. So COVID is just an accelerating event, and I'll give you an example uh, here it, because this is all connected. Um, so, so I'll use commercial real estate as an example. So 10 million users on Zoom, what we're on right now, um, a month and a half ago, is now 300 million users um, on Zoom. For Zoom, it, they didn't hire hundreds of thousands of new employees to keep up with that growth. It's all digital in nature, and we do that work. And our, so our cost of the work has just come down, has plummeted, plummeted. And so if you believe that when COVID is over, 300 million users is going back to 10 million, then Zoom will fall in value and commercial real estate will go through a V-shaped recovery. Right? It, if, if, you, if you don't believe that, and I don't see any possible evidence that it goes back to 10 million, because right? a lot of people will go, wait, this working from home thing is actually not bad. Um, and I don't need all of these offices and I don't need to drive two hours a day into back and back and forth. I can actually get more done with less time, less time and more time for my family. If you believe that, and let's say Zoom goes from 300 million to 200 million, um, then there's a hundred million, um, uh, there's, sorry, there, uh, um, there's 200 million people, 190 million people who aren't renting office space anymore. And if they're not renting office space anymore, then, then commercial office, uh, real estate, and that's one video conferencing company times everyone that's going through the similar thing. Um, if they're not renting office space uh, anymore, commercial space ha has to come down a lot, right? And uh, commercial rents, and then rents have to follow, and you get deflation there. You get deflation there, and the banks own commercial real estate, and the, and the and, or hedge funds, or who's ever owning the commercial real estate, some of them will be insolvent because they have loans against that commercial real estate and the new rents don't pay for the loan. Right. So, so it's so connected all together and why the governments are trying to prop up commercial real estate, even leverage loans is everything else. Cause if it falls to its natural order, which it has to fall to its natural order from what we just talked about, if you just follow the trail, um, then it's massively deflationary massively deflationary um and so so you have to create more money out of thin air to try to bail that out and it's just a house of cards oh my god okay so that, so that of, is one yeah. example mm -hmm. but you could take that example through every single industry today mm -hmm. um and, and and it would look similar it's crazy so all these people that you know sort of park their you know their, their wealth into sort of into real estate as a store of value let's just take i don't know manhattan or new york like what's going to happen to those real estate objects I mean, you know that doesn't so that's, worse. That, 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 that's that's the point here so that's <laughs> the point so you can imagine how many people are saying you have to protect this right and 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 this is where i want to it's not bad people on both sides it's yeah. there's some it's incentives <laughs> it's, it's, in, it's incentives and bad uh, and bad structure to create perverse incentive, incentives that requires bailouts all the time. So, and the government doesn't know they're here, right? I don't think I don't think the Fed knows that this is uh, like because just like Kodak didn't know the digital camera would take their business, 
right? Just like Blockbuster adds candy aisle to the stores instead of dealing with the first principle that Netflix growth, depending on, uh, on download speeds, changes everything and it renders my business obsolete. So, so the natural course of action is to protect the existing instead mm -hmm. of seeing how it can be. In fact, that's why entrepreneurs create so much value because they say, this existing doesn't work. It's insane. What, um, what could it look like? And they build to what it could look like. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they're early. A lot of times they make mistakes along there, but they see a different world and they build to, to where it's going. So, so, so now go back to your question, what happens to real estate? Well, we've already talked about what happens to real estate. The only thing that makes that not happen to real estate is, is bailouts, mm -hmm. right? Or uh, that artificially keep real estate high, that enrich the people with real estate. Um, actually, it's the only thing that keeps real estate high. Right? It, uh, the, 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 that's the, or, or other countries debasing their currencies fast enough and you get massive money flows into uh, into the U.S. to keep real estate high, but it's all coming from the same thing. It's it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's devaluing the, your currency, and it's detached from reality, Jeff. Right? I mean, look at the stock market. Does it have any any attachment? Any any reflection? It doesn't have any reflection to Main Street. It has to do. But here, here's the thing: something to be careful of, and it's actually it's it would be what I'm about to say is going to be strong on Bitcoin as well for the same reasons. Go to other examples in other countries. Um, and, and this is a long way off in the U.S., uh, or I think it's a long way off in the U.S., but who knows in today's, there's going to be lots of changes and the speed of those changes is going to uh, be staggering. So things that looked good could look bad in an instant depending on policy response. Um, but, but look at uh, Venezuela. Right, is when they, when they went through a 1.8 billion percent uh, inflation. Um, what if you owned the best company in Venezuela? Right. What 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 happened if you owned 20 percent stock in the best company? So stock price being attached to reality and the fundamental unit of measure being a currency that it that is going to get destroyed doesn't protect you. Right. Oh my. Uh, so Jeff, uh, I'm trying to find that quote, but anyway, uh, uh, within the content, uh, within the context of uh, entrepreneurship, so you're saying, uh, you said in your book that, um, you know, that considering the alternative, allowing abundance without the jobs might actually open up entirely new enlightenment era where we have, you know, where we have the, the, you know, the time to enjoy the benefits the technology brings. Uh, and and then you say what's, what I really love about that uh, quote is that but those creating value such as you know entrepreneurs would be paid or you know I'm thinking of engineers inventors there's so many you know ingenious people out there would be paid for the value creation at a rate that matched the new realities of supply and demand in our digital world. Now let me tie this in with with the with the most important question I want to ask is like what I really find strange is that. Um, I get it, you know, information technology has been exponentially evolving, but if we look at all the other sectors, you know, uh, transportation, we are, we're still burning fuel, we have combustion engine, what kind of whatever, uh, one to many or, or uh, but we haven't had really zero to, zero to one technological innovations in other sectors. So I think once we have the monetary root laying, once we have, you know, uh, a fundamental structure, that is ethical, that is uh, logical, rational, and 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 sound. Uh, do you think we're gonna have finally, you know, all these technologies uh, that will, you know, such as transportation or? Um, uh, I think it's coming in anyways. All of it's it coming anyway. How no, fast no. do you think it's gonna happen? Like it's gonna take. Um. So that's what I'm getting at. The speed, the rate of change. If you look at the rate of change with AI. Right? And, and what's happening in, in, in AI. Most people are, like, you see it in your Siri search, you see it in things, you see it in, um, how do you think when you go to Google? Do you think people are sorting those or, uh, sites? It's all done with AI, right? Mm -hmm. And so you never go to page 572, 
you go to the first page because it always gives you the results you want and it's all AI driven and the things and it's getting better and better and better photo quality um, the facial recognition um, now you connect some of these things and what happens in ID and, 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 and um, and then you add to data sets and you see different patterns that no one could pick up on. So the bigger the data set and the more patterns than everything else, the AI is seeing things that we can't pick up on. And, and so it's moving at light speed already. Uh, and that, that's, across, that's across every industry, every category. So it's already, that, that's happening. Uh, solar energy is now competing um, with lowest cost energy in regions of the world. And solar keeps going down and down and down. You could question how long that trend is, but the, where we are right now, you, let's talk about incentive structures and capitalism for a second. If solar energy is higher cost, even if you, even if you add up kind of all the damage that the, the, the fossil fuel fuels do to the environment, if solar energy is higher cost, it's almost impossible to stop people from countries, people from using lower cost energy, because it's a number one input to our economies, right? Without energy, there is no life. And it's about 10% of GDP. And if you have to pay more for energy to make your things and drive your economy, then your economy is uncompetitive. So it, it, with, that, with that lens, and you look around the world, it's no wonder a military complex engages uh, to be able to, to protect cheap energy. It's no wonder. Uh, it's no wonder that energy is that valuable because it runs our economies, and the run is, and, and so much about it is kind of an economic force that we move uh, across the world. Um, but that changes if solar drops uh, drops lower, and it's dropping lower right now. Um, all of the all of the investment goes into solar, and and that. And that depresses oil prices because now it increases the amount. Now it doesn't have to change overnight. If it keeps coming down in price over and over and over, then then the new investment it drives a whole innovation because of the cost um, that you don't need all of the other all of the other stuff. Not, and I'm going to this is going to be overreaching a little bit, but a bunch of the a bunch of the coal will stay in the ground from now till eternity right so uh, um, it needs the transition time that transition time might be 50 years to be able to to change cha change energy policies and everything else but the, if you just follow the trend it's all right, it's and, and that's going to be more deflation added to all the other deflation from here right because energy prices will get uh, uh, lower each year that's my dog do it, was it, I mean, you're at the forefront of technology. I mean, you probably talk to so many people who are really insiders. Um, can I ask, I mean, is there something like that that could be really mind blowing in the next years or let's say in the next 10, 15 years, which could <laughs> radically like transform the way we transport ourselves or move or, you know, fly or, you know, or whatever? Well, I, I, I just think it's the, it's the, 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 the so I, I think so most people know some of the, the um, what's coming let's take self-driving cars right mm -hmm. as an example what they, they don't what most people don't do is they don't add up the consequences or the benefits and the consequences of self-driving cars because it's not just so you have car companies right now that are driving production based on everybody having two cars you, and and they're forecasting the production on a, on on that uh, on, on, on that angle, and self-driving cars changes that paradigm because you don't actually drive a car. You might think you drive a car um, because of the way it looks and everything else, and and some people would. But if you could have a car on demand whenever you wanted it, it changes the economic value of a car, right? And so you yeah, you then then maybe I'll maybe I'll buy that on a monthly fee and I'll have it here whenever I want it and I'll use that car whenever I want it. And that changes economic models drastically and it changes the amount of cars needed. It changes insurance. It changes the amount of space needed in cities for, for, for parking for peak 
at use all the time. So you need two spots, two spots at your house. You need two spots. So uh, garages downtown. A lot of that uh, on a new model changes things that people don't think about when they pull together all the district on all the other things that change because of that. Those are the bigger ones right now. There are things in the lab right now around around material science, around AI on material science, um, that's that instead of steel using beams that are incredibly lightweight that have properties that are staggering in, in, in relation. There's a lot of stuff in the lab uh, that uh, that tied into additive manufacturing changes ch changes things. Additive manufacturing at the rate that that's moving, right? Um, you will it will look at some point like the Jetsons, right? That that and if it looks like the Jetsons and you can print anything you want in your house first locally and then in in, um, in your house, then the value of things is really like Google value of information because it's a digital, it's a digital unit that can be printed anywhere. And, 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 and so all of those things, um, and, and I'm involved in some, uh, uh, some of these, they are coming, they are coming. And, um, and, and, and I don't want to give that timeline because, mm -hmm. because you can use the, but, but I would say there it's touching so many different industries right now. And the, consolidation of what what happens as you consolidate data in into in into some of this it's staggering you know uh jeff i mean we're all trying in the bitcoin community to like to inspire and educate our you know our my listeners you know friends fam i've turned myself you know a lot of people within my you know close environment into bitcoiners um and i mean there's a reason and the intention and vision behind this book uh, the price of tomorrow um, so do you see like, uh, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm wishing that we could just accelerate this process. Um, maybe it has to do with my impatience, but I know it's possible. It just, uh, the, the conditions are not right, right now, maybe mature enough. Maybe there's, there's a reason for, for this sort of slow, gradual, but then maybe sudden you sound, process. <laughs> you, you sound like an entrepreneur. Um, that's it, it, entrepreneurs think the same way. Like, how do we speed this up? How do we move this forward? It's painful in, in the divide between seeing something and getting and, and, and moving there and building it. So the on ramps are, it takes time. And then more and more people join that new direction and then it just spins and, and, uh, and it moves. That's, that's just what it looks like, no matter what, uh, what happens. What I would say is uh, for, for a lot of your, uh, your uh, listeners, um, it's easy to look at everybody else and say, you should do it, right? Yeah, you should do this. This makes no sense and everything else. Try to unite instead of divide. Mm -hmm. Instead of, um, instead of, uh, there's, there's a lot of, um, there are people that have their head in the sand on this. Um, yeah. but, um, but, but most of them aren't bad people. They just, they haven't looked deep enough, uh, um, on this. So try to use that to, there's so much division in the world right now. And the mm -hmm. default position is division. The best leaders, the best chance of actually creating something lead from uniting. Right. And I listened to your interview, by the way, which I loved with Preston Pish, where you also at the end, you say, you know, how can we approach like in communicate, communicating, uh, you know, educating or opening up people. Uh, and this is also what comes really clearly out of your book, the, the empathy and the reason why, you know, that's going to, you know, with the death of your brother and your children. And so I think at the end of the day, we've got to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? You know, what kind of world do we want to see ourselves? Do you want to like share for before we wrap up? Like, what is your like, yeah? So, so on that and this, it's an interesting. Why do you do what you do, right? And why do I do what I do and everything else? I would say at the highest level is we do what we do out of love, right? We want to belong, or so belonging, love, and and people try to get that a whole bunch of different ways, right? Most people try. And some people try to get it through power. Some people try to get it through wealth, right? If I have this much money, then I'll matter and people will care about me. If I say these things, people will care about me. It, it, it is an interesting way to live. So, so what is a person, what is a, 
um, what if, if you looked at say a friend who's a victim, right? Who's victim mentality all the time and they're on Facebook, what do they do? Right? Victim, victim, oh, this happened to me, this happened to me, this happened to me. Um, and when people stop leaning in, what does that person do? They double down, mm -hmm. right? They double down more of a victim because they're desperate for love. That's what they're after. But it's actually no different, the hero. That's what they're after too, right? So, so it's universal in humanity that we're all looking to belong. We all that we all matter. It's not it's not good or bad. It's just if you know that about yourself and you know that about humanity, you can connect the dots to uh, to to help people get there or tell them the truth on where, where they're stopping that from from happening. I used to say this in YPO, uh, Young Presidents Organization, all the time. If you look at your calendar, you'll measure what you actually value. And so you can say, I really care about my family, and this is why I'm doing this. But if your calendar is 100% work, it's hard to actually say, right? Because, because, because when you're good at work, when you're good at uh, work, it, you get validation, right? Mm -hmm. People tell you you're good, you're pretty, they, you, you, you want to do it more. So it's important you know that. Uh, um, that. So if you, if you buy what I just said, right? It's the same reason why people can divide people, mm -hmm. right? So because people's desperate need to belong so badly can, can say, hey, you and me know this, right? Those, those people don't know that. The people will bite every time. The higher power is to unite. The longer term power is to unite. It always has been and everything else. Short term, you can divide and you can divide and divide. Um, uh, long-term uh, unite lean into love lean into and i know that's not to, probably something that you hear a lot of times on your bitcoin, <laughs> coin boss podcast but that would be the best way to move this forward into a different if we want abundance if we want uh, if we want to drive this message home uh, to society that is the best way to drive it uh, home uh, to, to society and every single person plays a role Right, right. And you, you know, you mentioned your book in connection with that, you say that, um, you know, people look for value, you know, sort of belonging to a group and the career, the, you know, the, the identity of in connection with the jobs in a, in a world, you know, of abundance and prosperity, people could actually do, do things that maybe they've always wanted to do, whether it be creative or technological research, whatever that is, you know, art. Uh, and I think there's a lot of people which I talked to is they say they couldn't even imagine like not having the job that they're having right now. So, um, that's, that's, what, that's why it's connected, uh, Gabin. Um, it's, it's because they get that value from the mm -hmm. job, right? Mm -hmm. And they get, they get that love or belonging or you matter from the job. And so, so, but, but if you actually scratch the surface, it's your, um, uh, if you, you take that down to a first principle you can find that belonging in a whole bunch of different ways and you could actually uh, you could really take humanity to a different level um, if you don't have to get it from driving two hours to a job to be able to come back to, to spending all, all, all your time there now if you want it from a job if that's what you want then, then great there will still be jobs there's tons mm -hmm. of opportunity right now uh, as well like the but what's happening in technology it's not like jobs are going to go to zero tomorrow it's going to be a, a driving trend out and there's lots of uh, wealth building opportunities and, and opportunities there fantastic hey jeff i really enjoyed our talk it's it's a lot of uh, you know the insights you're giving me and your perspectives it's you know always wanted to talk to you about this and uh, you know we've been waiting actually for this book i've been recommending this book your book to to all, all you know all my friends so um, I know you've also invited your readers or your, your followers to, to join to join you, which I really find awesome. The, the Price of Tomorrow platform, if I may call it. Uh, what, what, uh, is there any like, resources you want to make, direct my, my listeners to? Well, probably for now, uh, my team is coming up with some. Here's the interesting thing. You, you know this from reading the book, but I didn't do write the book to drive. Uh, I don't need to sell books. Um, I don't mm -hmm. need, it's not. I, 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 um, I, I did it to drive this message. In a perfect world, um, the I wouldn't need to be the person driving the message. 
that a whole bunch of other people would drive, uh, uh, drive the message and I could just fall back into the, um, so I'll do whatever I need to right now. So I have a team working on some of the things that you just talked uh, talked about, but um, for now, uh, probably Twitter, follow me on Twitter at Jeff, uh, Jeff Booth. My website is jeffreybooth.com if you wanted to send me an email, um, but that's probably best for now. Thank you so much, Jeff. Hope to, you know, have you back soon in something in the new future and I'll be following you anyway. So uh, keep up the great work. <laughs> really enjoyed it. All right. <laughs> bye bye. Have a good day. See ya. See you. All right. This is, it was just awesome. Fantastic. So this is what I, what I meant is, you know, uh, Unfortunately, you know, people, uh, humanity, uh, because it's not their fault, it's, you know, we, we need to educate, we need to inspire, we need to give them the comprehension of, you know, what are the root causes, why, and what kind of, you know, potential, huge potentials, uh, you know, Bitcoin, starting with Bitcoin, you know, this uh, soundest, uh, scarcest and hardest money, uh, decentralized and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, and really evolutionary money could, could, could unfold, could, could trigger uh, this, this chain reaction of, of, of uh, you know, economical, scientific, technological, spiritual evolution and innovation, technological innovations. And, you know, we could all live in a world of abundance, prosperity, joy, pleasure, freedom. You know, at the end of the day, it's all about freedom. So thank you so much again for listening and hope, let me know your questions. My email address is hello at the total .com. Make sure you follow, uh, you follow Jeff Booth on Twitter and, uh, and get, you know, you should definitely get his book. The price of tomorrow is a Kindle version. I have a Kindle version. It's, it's, I read it like three times because it's so thrilling. It was so deep. It was so, you know, simply written, you know, like you, you could literally understand what kind of civilization, what kind of, of tomorrow, uh, could, could await us. And yeah. And just follow him on, on Twitter, the price of tomorrow. And Jeff Booth is his Twitter handle, his own personal Twitter handle. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much for listening. My email address again is hello at the You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Telegram, what have you. And please, I would really appreciate if you give me a, a like, retweet, reshare so that this information, this knowledge, this comprehension, these inspirations uh, reach as many people as possible around the planet who speak and understand uh, uh, you know, uh, English, uh, because I'm going to try to do this also in German, at least a, a summary version or talk to other uh, people, uh, maybe uh, somehow exchange thoughts, knowledge, and, you know, share, share inspiration and, you know, build a better world uh, for, for ourselves and for, for our children and future children. Thank you so much again, and I'll see you soon. The Total Connector signs off.